Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yep. Um, welcome here. to the uh, town council workshop, a joint workshop of the Cape Elizabeth and Scarborough town councils um, on Wednesday, March 16th. Um, and I'm glad to be hosting both councils tonight. I'm hoping another councilor for, or two from Cape Elizabeth will join us as we get going. But since this is the first time um, this group is meeting, I thought um, before we tee this up, it might be helpful just to do a real quick um, round of introductions. Um, I'll I'll start um, on that. We'll start. Maybe we'll start on the Cape side, um, and um, and then we can introduce the folks from Scarborough. So, I'm Jeremy Gabrielson. I am the council chair of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council this year, and I'll turn it over to Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Gillis. I'm new to the town council this year. Great. Yeah. Oh. Matt. And I am Tim Reiniger. I'm also new to the council. Elizabeth. Great. Um, hi, Nicole. Welcome. We're just doing a quick round of introductions. I'll let you get settled for a second. So, uh, Matt, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, sir. Happy to. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good to see many of you again. Uh, Matt Sturgis, I'm town manager for the town of Cape Elizabeth. Maureen? Uh, hi, I'm Maureen O'Meara. I'm the town planner in Cape Elizabeth. Jay? Hi, everyone. Jay Reynolds, public works director for the town. Um, Debbie? Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Deborah Lane. I am pleased to be the town clerk in Cape Elizabeth. Great. And Nicole? Hey everyone, I'm Nicole Boucher. I'm a member of the town council and the finance chair. Great, and John, if you wanna walk us through council um, introductions on your end, that'd be great. Yeah, I'd be happy to. We're all um, present in the room here, so I'm not sure how we'll come across for you. Councilor Katarina is remote. Uh, I'm John Clucci, I'm the, the chair of Scarborough Town Council. And why don't we start with Councilor Hamill and then just work across there. John Hamill, town councilor. Ken Johnson, town councilor. Paul Johnson. Town Councilor. Hi, everybody. John Anderson. April Seidler. And uh, Tom Hall, Town Manager. And I'm Angela Blanca, Town Engineer. Do we have any other remote participants? Uh, Jeannie Fitch, to be online, our Sustainability Coordinator. Yeah, and I'm I, Fitch, Sustainability Coordinator. Yeah, and I'm Jean Marie Katarina, uh, Town Councilor from Scarborough. I used to live in Cape Elizabeth, and I used to travel over that Sawyer Road section all the time, so. Very good. That's all of us. Great. Well, thank you all for doing a quick round of introductions. Um, hopefully, at some point, if we get are discussing this any further, we can actually all get together in the same room. Um, I would just note for anyone who's watching at home um, that uh, in addition to the folks on the panel tonight, we have uh, 10 attendees calling in as well. Um, and um, why don't we go ahead and get started? Maureen, could I ask you to just tee this up for us? Certainly. So uh, my name is Maureen O'Meara, as I already stated, and I'm bringing up the memo that hopefully all of you have seen, and I'm, I'm not going to read it to you. So take a breath of relief there. And I'm also going to try to be very respectful of the fact that I do understand that March is one of the worst times to ask town councils to have meetings. So I'm going to try to hit highlights, um, go through this fairly quickly. Uh, but we're here talking about Sawyer Road. And this is an image from Google. And as you can see this, uh, if I start from the north, this is the intersection with Wells Road. This is Sawyer Road. It travels down the hill. Um, it travels into the marsh. This is the culvert. And this is also a municipal boundary line between Cape Elizabeth to the north and Scarborough to the south. And then it continues another approximately 1,100 feet in the marsh and then out of the marsh and it connects up with Route 77. So why are we talking about Sawyer Marsh and the Sawyer Road and the Sawyer Culvert? Um, I first became familiar with this when I was meeting with Jake Amon from the uh, Wells, Reserve, Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve because they were doing work on impacts to habitat in marshland. And I think you can all see here that we've got this lovely thread of the Spurwink River 
But right here at Sawyer Road, we've kind of got a round end on either side. So it looks a little bit like a dumbbell. And what this is telling us is that there are scouring pools being eroded into the marsh on both sides of the culvert because the culvert is acting as a constraint to tidal flow. And that's, that's not a good thing, one, because of the erosion um, to habitat. And this is the Spurwink Marsh. It's, it's a statewide focus of habitat, but also because it's eroding the, the supports on the culvert. So uh, we moved ahead with a study where we um, looked at the culvert. There was a really detailed title study done. And the results are that there's, there's holes in the culvert at the top. Um, we've got this, this title constraint. It's getting to the point where we're gonna have to look at replacement. And the replacement estimates are in the range of two and a half million to five million. Um, but the real problem is if, if we do the work on the culvert, um, and I'm moving to the next page of the memo, we still have another problem. And this is a product from the title study. And the dark red here, the darker the red, the greater the velocity and flow of the river. And so you can, it's, it's easy to see how it's very dark red here underneath the Sawyer Road because it's constraining flows and then it, the flows dissipate and it's doing these eroding pools. But the problem is after you fix the culvert, what you haven't done is deal with the problem south of the culvert, which is that the road floods. Uh, it floods regularly, it floods at king tides, it floods during storms. And the challenge is that if you make this major infrastructure investment in the culvert, you still haven't dealt with this issue. We learned when we're working on the culvert that we have to plan for sea level rise, that you can't even plan for the ultimate in sea level rise. You only plan for the amount of sea level rise that is equivalent to the lifespan of the culvert. So if you're trying to fix this road at the same time you're trying to fix the culvert, you're looking at having to add six feet of fill to pull the, the road out from this constant flooding situation. And even if you do that, you, you probably are going to have more impacts on the marsh and the fill is gonna to start to sink into the marsh. So maybe what needs to happen instead is not continuing to add fill to this road, but to create um, a causeway, which, which environmentally would be better. It lifts the road completely out of the marsh it will be more resilient to sea level rise. But at this point, you're talking many, many millions of dollars. And at that point, we, we suggest that both the town of Cape Elizabeth and the town of Scarborough take what we're calling a capital improvement pause. Because if you're going to spend this kind of money on infrastructure, is this where you would spend it in your community? Um, and I, I just want to, in Cape Elizabeth, we talk about um, the Spurwink Ave Road that we also need to deal with. And we talk about uh, potentially doing something with Shore Road. And I don't want to uh, speak for the town of Scarborough. Um, I don't know if this will work. I guess it won't work. But in our conversations with uh, staff in Scarborough, the, the question becomes, is this really the right place to go? And I would point to the constant flooding issues that you have on Route 1 in Scarborough because sea level rise is something that's happening. And one of the things you can do is retreat. And then the other thing you need to do is rebuild your infrastructure to be more resilient. So un unless there's any more questions, that's really all I have for a presentation. Great. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I guess um, before we go to um, discussion, I just ask um, Jamie if you had anything to add to that from the Scarborough side. Uh, no, I think that Maureen did a really good job summarizing the, um, the, the work that um, the consultants and um, Jake did and that we all um, participated in. Um, it was 
a very long process with lots of stakeholder discussion. Um, and it, through that process, we weren't even considering um, retreat as, as Maureen just mentioned as an option. Um, and so really we're looking for um, input, I would say from town leadership in terms of where, what we might want to look at next related to Sawyer Street in Scarborough, Sawyer Road in Cape Elizabeth. Great, thank you. Um, I guess, um, why don't we start with questions? Um, Matt, I also see that that um, Jake Amon is on the list of um, attendees. If you wanna bring him up, he might be able to respond to some additional questions. Um, J uh, John, I can't see everyone on the Scarborough Council, so um, why don't we start with you? And and if you want to just you know, let me know who's got questions or has their hands up um, to start off. I can I, I can see um, Jean Marie, so we'll start with her. Why don't we start with Councilor Kettering? All right, thank you so much. Um, actually, uh, I'm glad you did bring this up because as I said, I use that. Uh, cut through occasionally because I still have relatives who live in Cape Elizabeth. Um, but m I guess one of my questions would, I mean, I'm fine with taking the road out. I, I mean, but I don't use it all the time. I'm not, you know, living next to it or whatever, but dare I assume that we did a public safety study to show that if you removed that room, uh, excuse me, that road, that you would not be in negatively impacting the ability of um, fire service and ambulances and whatever to, to reach folks on either the Scarborough or the uh, Cape Elizabeth side. Yeah, Jay, you wanna take a crack at that one? Sure, if you don't mind me jumping in, I can help answer that. I think one of the suggested next steps that, that we talked about as staff at the last time was maybe to just take an additional step, which would include um, exactly what you explained to evaluate the emergency services and um, what the impacts would be uh, to, to that service, as well as what it would mean for uh, commuters, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the like as well. Um, so that would be a, ne a next step. I think we were looking to, to see if, if uh, both councils were interested in, in pursuing that. And so um, I guess this is a question for Maureen. I, I, I'm guessing, you know, this so we're in a workshop discussion here, but I'm guessing the outcome that staff are looking for tonight is some sense from both councils as to whether um, it's worth moving forward with figuring out what that retreat, the costs and considerations around the retreat option might look like so that, because um, that hasn't, it just hasn't been considered as an option up to this point? Is, is that the, the feedback? And I guess any additional questions that folks would like to have answered? To consider? Yeah, I, yes, exactly. I mean, I think we all know that there is uh, infrastructure funding that's available out there right now that we haven't seen in a while and we don't expect it to last forever. Uh, this, prod, this, this road with, I mean, I can't overstate how important this marsh is for habitat at the statewide level. And that's a good thing if you're looking for grant funding to study these kind of options. So this is a great time to look at these kind of things. Um, and that's what we're looking for to get some guidance. Should we pursue that? And I see my boss's hand is up. Yeah, go for it, Matt. And then we'll see if there's other questions from the Scarborough Council. Well, first, there wasn't a stop sign. Uh, so if I, if, I, if I broke you off, please, uh, please forgive me. Uh, Part of it is a uh, you know conversation uh, on this item started uh, prior to the pandemic is when we actually received the study but uh, uh, you know we have had that cause that that moment of pause that we've all been enjoying oh so much uh, over the past two plus years but uh, Tom and I had spoken about this uh, at that time and you know one of the biggest challenges then was the uh, availability of funds. And that is one of the areas that has changed since then for planning as well as for, for implementation of what uh, the end result is. So that's one of the, uh, one of the impetus of trying to pull both, uh, both councils together to have this discussion to see, A, if there is uh, the desire to go forward and uh, you know, pursue planning grants, pursue other uh, fund, fund availabilities that can help us uh, meet the, meet whatever solution that is uh, ultimately decided that works best for, for both Scarborough and for Cape Elizabeth. So 
Uh, that is one of the changes that has taken place is there are, you know, there is the availability of more infrastructure funds out there. And I think this is an area that I think we feel would compete very, uh, very well uh, with, with other projects and, uh, and, and for multiple reasons as Maureen had also identified. So thanks, thanks for the opportunity to jump in. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, John, you wanna let, let us know who has questions from, from your end in the room there? Yeah, this isn't so much a question, but I think it's relevant. And it's something I re received just before the meeting. We did send notice out to residents um, that, that live on Sawyer Street and we heard back from one, uh, uh, Linda and Ernie Broadwater. And, uh, they asked it actually be read and I think it, the, the council will be interested and I haven't had a chance to show it out yet. Um, there are several points to consider. Um, uh, of which our councils are probably well aware. Having the road discontinued would be a benefit to the ecology of the river and marshy areas. We support that option. We assume you will be consulting the appropriate ecology experts. With that in mind, we are also aware of the safety issues at the intersection of Soria Street and Route 77. There would be an increased danger as fewer cars would be slowing down to make a left or right onto Sawyer. We would be forced to use that route exclusively to go anywhere, especially during commuter time. We now choose to go over the river and onto Wells Road to get back out to 77. When driving directly onto 77 from Sawyer, vehicles coming from the south um, right can't see the turning um, to try to negotiate a safe left onto 77. Until that oncoming vehicle is at the intersection, it is very unsafe and we've had some near accidents. My husband has discussed this with the town, but nothing has been done. If members on your councils haven't used the intersection as I've described, they should do so at high traffic times. Try it on a busy summer uh, beach weekend or Friday evening. So with the benefits of having a road closure over the river, please acknowledge that there is an existing safety concern that will become worse. Perhaps blinking amber lights, caution signs, reduced speed, and mirrors would be considered necessary. Please read this at your workshop as we don't believe we'll be able to attend. Um, so I just wanted to share that. And the town manager has shared that uh, I believe we do have an upcoming project to study improvements uh, to the furway section yeah. of that intersection. Yeah, there'll be a public process. Uh, we did communicate with them uh, just this afternoon. So we expect we'll engage them and their neighbors uh, in that very direct discussion. We think we can probably do some small realignment of the road and, and hopefully improve site distance as part of that. Um, yeah, thanks. thanks John. And just as a user too, I can say, you know, I, I ride my bike there regularly and I'm familiar with the uh, difficulty making a left there. So, uh, you know, certainly if we're changing the traffic configuration in there, I'd, I'd be supportive of including that as part of the larger project to see what types of, of other um, access improvements are needed, would be needed if we go. You I, know, just wanted, I just wanted to add that that was one of the main elements when we went into the design. Right now, we're looking at preliminary design and looking at doing a public meeting um, it, next within the next month or two um, to try to final to get feedback to finalize those plans. But that was an initial goal of the project when we started working on the design of the our spur road segment. So definitely been on the forefront. Okay. Councilor Hamill and then Johnson. Now I want to follow up on a comment that was made by Ms. O'Meara about you know about us from the term capital improvement clause. So um, beyond that, you know, it's a great term. I'd like to learn more about it and how it might be applied to our own in the budgeting process in a broad fashion. But that's a set for another day. But if we were going to go that route, what would be? How would that work? In, in, in your, is your is your thinking you would do a pause now, and then if so, for how long? Um, and the other part of that question is, you know, would it be kind of like skipping your dental plan for a couple of years where you don't take it, you don't do the annual improvements, and then guess what? You're, you know, you're cleaning and now turns into implants, you know. So, I mean, I, so what do you have thoughts about that? You know, what the, how that would work and how you would use it? Maureen, I, mean, I can, yeah, if you want. I think so, that's so, a good idea, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially it's before either town makes any kind of capital investment um, in the conventional sense, which would be finding a fix, you know, raising the road bed, replacing the culvert. Um, I think what we're here tonight is to say, is there a different path forward, uh, a radically different path? And and if there's interest, I think we'd like to pursue that to see if that if that's something that is actually feasible. Uh, it's not as simple, I don't think, as putting Jersey barriers up on either side and saying good. Um, as Mrs. Broadwater uh, mentioned, I think there's a lot of stakeholder ecological interest there. I expect we're moving to pavement at the very least, but maybe even further restoration. So 
Uh, I think the pause would allow us time to further explore this, if that's your will, and come back to you. Uh, it's not going to cost nothing, but I think it's going to be considerably less, is my expectation, than the traditional fix approach. Yeah, we just want to heard the infrastructure money could be used for this. Is that is that in uh, relative to the study, the broader study for uh, if the road was done away with, where where the traffic would go and the concerns of the folks that just read the email? Is that included in it, or is the infrastructure available to actually do the causeway on the existing? I'm not sure if we can answer that. I think the general point that uh, Maureen made or Matt made that uh, there's just a lot of infrastructure money at the federal level right yep. now, and that's not going to last forever. I think our timing is also good in that the, the current administration in Augusta with their climate action plan, uh, this is you know, right in line with the sort of things they're talking about. I dare say there's probably no other projects that are, pro that are proposing the sort of approach that we are. They're looking at other more traditional approaches. So. Uh, and then when you combine the the, uh, the strength of two towns uh, backing an application, I think it really goes well for our success. Um, so to answer your question, it may be that infrastructure money can go to provide some other fixes, if you will, that are ancillary to this. Or, or, or at least for study. The, the or impact of the study, if we yeah. were to disengage yeah. the road. I can see grant money certainly uh, fully understanding the impact of this approach. So it definitely feeds the decision whether you Sure. Or make the road in there. So, I mean, if that's the next step item, then I would support that next step. Sure. Yeah, here's that. I mean, it sounds like what we're being asked is can you, can you pursue a study to determine if this is the right thing to do or not? And it's even just from what we shared tonight, it seems like it might just be the best thing, anyways, to do the due diligence and, and invest in the study to, to really confirm that. I think it seems that to be sense to me. John, sorry, I'm sorry to jump in. I had a hard time hearing that last comment on on the on the microphone. Would you mind either repeating or I don't know I if there's to, a mic. I need to enunciate. So I, I was just saying I'm supportive of the approach and would would support um, further study at this at this time. And Councilor Seiler, I I agree. Like if that's if that's the next logical step. Um, Rather than moving forward with any other kind of capital investment, I, I would be in support of the study as well. Great, thank you. And we heard you both pretty. I, I did that second time, so thank you. <laughs> um, I saw a hand up from Councillor Reiniger. Um, so why don't we go and just uh, we'll, maybe we'll go through folks on the Cape side and see what questions, first reactions you have. I hate to ask a stupid question, but I'm just trying to clarify my mind where the intersection issue would be. Is it Sawyer near Ocean House Market or Sawyer near the Higgins Beach street area? Because isn't it they're all 77? It'd be Sawyer at it'd be the Sawyer end in Scarborough uh, as you come out on the on the far end towards the Higgins Beach end. Okay. Yes. So right when you cross the bridge going into Scarborough, the first right if you're heading south on 77. But I think I, I think the point is a good one. I, I mean, obviously, so Wells Road and, and Sawyer Road in Cape Elizabeth is a lot lower traffic volume than 77, but it may be worth looking at traffic implications at that intersection as well. Other other reactions or comments from folks on the Cape Council? Yeah, Nicole. I am in support of studying further because I think if we went and said we might be taking this out and restoring the marsh or whatever decision is made, it's important to do that due diligence and show that we have thought about the emergency planning and um, any other impacted locations. I used to drive that route every single day. I know very well taking a left out of there to head toward Cape is very difficult, especially during certain times of year when the sun is right in your face. So I, I definitely think there'll be an impact there, but just, just wanted to echo that I think doing these studies right now makes sense. Great, thank you. And um, Susan, anything to add at this point? No, I agree with Nicole. I, I think we have to look at everything. Great, um, great. Thank, and and I, I agree to, you know, I, I both looking at this from the ecological perspective and then just looking at the potential financial implications of upgrading that culvert um, seems like it's well worth um, taking the time to, to study 
you know, what this alternative approach. Um, I guess the, um, the other thing that I just wanted to check in with on both councils um, is to see what other questions folks might have that we could answer in this next phase of study. So I've heard folks talking about the intersections you know, on the approaches, what, what that would look like on either end if the marsh segment of road were discontinued. I think cost um, is certainly a big um, consideration. Um, and, and that emergency response serve, um, question. Um, I, um, one other question that I have on my mind um, is, is just sort of the legal, excuse me, legal framework around discontinuance of the road. And if there's any um, considerations we, you know, around that, I, I know how much fun we've had with continuing or discontinuing streets that only exist on paper, so looking at discontinuing one that really is there. Um, and But um, I'm also curious, um, I want to thank Jake Amon from the Wells Reserve for joining us um, tonight as well, just to see if he's got any additional thoughts on other things that we should be thinking about with this next phase of study. Do you want to introduce yourself, Jack, Jake? And Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jake Amon. I'm the stewardship director at the Wells Reserve down in Wells. And um, have been very happily working with the town of Cape Elizabeth and Scarborough um, over the last couple of years to look at the Spurlink Marsh. Um, I think that the approach that's being taken here to step back and look holistically um, at your transportation um, infrastructure, your natural resources, um, and deciding how to best allocate funds in the future is, is really um, a good approach, um, particularly given the funding environment that we're in now with the infrastructure bill and multiple agencies having um, forthcoming RFPs for both studies and uh, engineering and construction phases of these types of projects. Um, I do anticipate that the study phase would be fundable through both natural resource and infrastructure um, focused opportunities. Um, one uh, piece of the project that, I, that, that hasn't, or I should say there's really two pieces of the project that haven't been mentioned yet. One is that there is the potential for negative impacts to the marsh with the removal of the road, at least in the short term. And that's through the rapid reintroduction of tidal flooding to areas that have potentially subsided over the years due to that tidal restriction, um, as well as historical impacts from agricultural practices like ditching and diking of the marsh, which was common throughout New England. And um, fortunately, we have marsh experts that are directly adjacent to this site, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge um, is well versed in these issues and they're very interested in this project. So I encourage the towns to continue to engage with that agency as you're making your plans moving forward. Um, and another piece of this project that I'd like to highlight is the potential for uh, adverse impacts to private property and public infrastructure upstream uh, after the reintroduction of tidal flooding. Um, of course, those impacts could be expected if there's nothing done at the culvert in the road um, due to sea level rise over time, eventually um, overtopping that structure frequently. Uh, but I think it's important for upstream uh, neighborhoods and residences to be um, considered and, and what the potential impacts might be at least within the design window of a potential culvert replacement. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that factors in uh, to this type of a study. Um, sea level rise is going to impact low-lying infrastructure and homes in many places, some of which don't have a large embankment that's acting as a dike and a temporary barrier to that flooding. So I'm not suggesting that a road embankment is a, a viable solution to preventing coastal flooding. I think of much the contrary, uh, natural marsh habitat, um, which accretes over time and gains elevation and maintains healthy vegetative cover is probably a better protection against shoreline uh, erosion and flooding. Um, but I think that that needs to be looked at as well. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jake. Appreciate you being able to join us tonight. Um, Tim, I see your hand up. Yeah, go for it. One last question uh, for the the town planners and so forth, the, the the properties on both sides of that marsh area, are there areas that you see as potentially uh, spots for you know, 
larger more developments of homes, neighborhoods or something, or is it all basically non-developable and pretty much set the way it is? I mean, in other words, with this, is that also a consideration here that there could be an area for another 50, 100 homes that would be disrupted or made more difficult? I'm willing to speak for Cape. Um, because of the, the way that the marsh angles to the Northwest, um, there really doesn't seem to be a lot of developable potential over there. It's, not, it's, ter it's definitely not in a growth area. Most of it is wetland that's already restricted from development. There's not any good road frontage. Um, I, I don't see it as any potential for great development to, to increase traffic loads in the future from that section. I don't know if someone from Scarborough wants to speak to that. I kind of suspect you're in the same situation on your side of the river. Angela, is that something you can speak to? Yeah, go ahead, Jamie, please. <laughs> you missed me saying Angela. <laughs> Um, oh. Tom was trying to speak. <laughs> no, I, I was just saying that I, I don't think what we're contemplating here would have any negative or positive effect on kind of land development. The, the underlying zoning will dictate. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I just can't imagine that this will have any any effect in that regard. But I would agree it's not in our growth area, so um, it would just be the front end, the Sawyer Road, the single family in that plot. It may be, make those that live there uh, be more desirable. They live on a dead end road, essentially. Uh, but I don't expect it's going to spur additional development. Great. Thank you. Um, I think what I'd like to do at this point, um, having heard from most of the folks um, on both councils as well as staff um, on this, uh, is just open it up for public comment. Um, so we have currently nine attendees on the Zoom call. Um, Tom, um, John, do you have any uh, public attendees in the room with you there? We do not. Okay. Um, so if anyone who's calling in on the Zoom call would like to um, to speak, um, please use the raise hand function in, in Zoom. Um, and if you can Identify yourself by name and address and keep your comments to around three minutes. That would be appreciated. All right, I see a hand up from Thund uh, name starting with Thunderdog. All right, you should, if you, you may have to unmute your own microphone on your end, but you should be able to speak now. Hey, funny, funny. I guess I got you to say my password. <laughs> um, I'll have to figure that out. Uh, my name is Noah Nagrin, 16 Phillips Street in Scarborough, Maine. Uh, I just had a quick comment about the intersection of Sawyer Street and Spurwink Road in Scarborough. The intersection is directly at the bottom of a huge hump. Uh, eastbound, when cars try to turn left onto Spurwink or from Spurwink onto Sawyer, they often have to put their blinker on and stop. Well, I have driven over that hump only to have to clamp on the brakes because there was three or four cars completely halted behind one guy that wanted to turn left. Well, from a traffic standpoint, disconnecting this road or fixing the intersection makes a lot of sense to me, uh, just from traffic. I won't go into details. Uh, because what happens outside the Scarborough lines, I do not believe is any of my business. Uh, but, and you know, there could be intersections in, in Cape Elizabeth that are also unpopular, which would absorb this traffic if Sawyer Street were disconnected. Uh, so I'm certainly aware of that. Now, as a taxpayer of Scarborough, I have little to no interest in funding this project. And uh, if the mentioned intersection remains at the bottom of a blind hill, I straight up have no interest. So if that's relevant, uh, I appreciate your valuable time and consideration and I'll let everybody else speak. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, if there's anyone else, I see a hand up from Paula House. Uh, Matt's gonna promote you and then you can unmute the microphone on your end. Yes, hi, my name's Paula House and I am one of the eight households that will, uh, in Scarborough, that will be um, affected by, uh, directly by, uh, the possible uh, discontinuance of this road. 
And I will tell you, I've lived here 30 years. I am, I am the first house in the marsh. I am most likely, as Jake said, to be possibly impacted by uh, the surge of water that might rise the, the, in, the, in the marsh for a short period of time before it equalizes, or maybe not. And uh, I am 100% in favor of discontinuing this road. It is a road that uh, has hosted wonderful recreational opportunities for people who care to go down it. But the current speed, speed limit is 40 miles per hour and mostly uh, that 40 mile per hour speed limit limits the, the mothers wanting to walk with baby carriages, uh, walkers with small children, but many people do use that road uh, for these purposes. And it is absolutely inconsistent with the other use of this road, which is fast moving big trucks. Lots of big trucks um, use this road. Um, too many big trucks use this road. And I've watched the marsh road sink over the 30 years I've been here. Um, I am entirely in favor of it. I, I think uh, any small inconvenience compared with the benefit of uh, the importance of the carbon sequestration that marshes provide for us. I think not rehabilitating this marsh is akin to saying, well, let's let Brazil or whoever keep, keep cutting down um, the trees because these are really marvelous uh, uh, accessories to, to uh, fighting uh, sea rise and, and other problems that we have. So I'm all for it. I will be voting in favor. <laughs> I have yet to see uh, an emergency vehicle come down this road, but I'll tell you every winter it is triage around that corner because there are accidents after accidents that happen at that sharp corner, right as you enter from uh, this Cape Elizabeth side to the Scarborough side. So many accidents will be avoided and I think there'll be a big benefit to both communities from, from that, both recreationally. And I think there are some opportunities there for looking at platforms and that sort of thing that will keep the marsh accessible to, to, uh, to both communities and to interested people. And I hope that you will look at that opportunity in your studies. What opportunity is there for having a non-motorized bridge across the marsh that is lifted and allows the natural restoration of the marsh, but still provides uh, really a unique opportunity in the middle of a very urbanizing area to be so close and so uh, far away from that urban feel. So I'm voting for it. And thank you so much for, for doing this. I'm really, really happy about it. Great, thank you. Um, I see three more hands raised. Um, uh, we're gonna um, go to um, David on next. Um, so Matt's bringing you up and if you wanna just um, unmute yourself on your end um, and identify yourself by a name and address. Hi there, this is actually Christina Letty. Um, and uh, David on and I are at for uh, Salt Marsh Way. We're actually uh, just off Sawyer, uh, right on the marsh. So we have a full view of the road in question. Um, it is uh, right down, right down the middle. Um, we're so fortunate to have the marsh in our backyard to see the herons and the hawks and uh, to see also all the recreation, all the folks kayaking and, and things like that. Um, we were really excited to get this letter because uh, the prospect of removing this road is really exciting for us. Um, the inconvenience to some households can't be overlooked. That, that is a fact. Um, it would make some of our regular trips a little more circuitous. But um, the idea of reducing amphibian deaths, um, of allowing wildlife to pass freely throughout the entirety of the marsh safely, um, the idea of uh, restoring this marsh in its entirety is um, so exciting. So um, 
really happy to hear everyone having this conversation. And I look forward to seeing how this progresses because I think it would be a real boon to the community to, to really look to the value of the marsh itself. And Paula had some really wonderful comments. Um, I, I think that that would serve us very much better than 1400 feet of often flooded road. So um, thanks very much and, and uh, looking forward to hopefully seeing this disappear. Great, thank you. Um, I see two more hands raised. We'll go to Bonnie Morgan and then Matt Craig. Oh, and then last, uh, well, last week, I think we'll go to Pete Slavinsky and I think that'll be everyone. So. Uh, Bonnie, you should be good to go. We're not hearing you. I don't know if you, you may need to unmute yourself on your end. Oh, hand went up. Still not coming through. All right, Bonnie, I am uh, apologize. We seem to be experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, if you are able to use the call-in number, if we see a phone number pop up um, on the participants list, we'll go ahead and bring you up to um, make your comments that way. Um, let's go over to Matt Craig. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, first of all, I want to just thank both towns and their staff for putting this joint workshop together. I think it's uh, terrific. I am a resident of Cape Elizabeth. I live on Six Farm Hill Road and I sit on the town conservation committee. I'm also employed by the Casco Bay Estuary Partnership and I participated in some of the feasibility studies that were commissioned by the town of Cape Elizabeth uh, a year or so ago. But I'm speaking now just as a citizen of Cape Elizabeth. So I wanna make that clear. Um, I just want to say I think the next steps outlined in the memo are really good and logical and they're going to provide the kind of information that I think a lot of uh, members of the community outside of this meeting are going to have so they're worth pursuing and I uh, think that looks good. Um, I just also want to say that I think this is a road that when you look at it, you know, it's pretty obvious that it never should have been built in the first place and it really does not belong there. I visit this road pretty often because it's uh, very photogenic in the sense that when there are astronomic high tides, so-called king tides, uh, there's often water on it. And those make for really compelling uh, visuals to tell the story of you know, the need for climate resilience. And so this kind of planning and this kind of study is uh, very timely and worthwhile. Um, I also wanna say that the options for keeping the road open in the future would be clearly very expensive. And they would also further impact the marsh too, because if you build the road up, which of course would be necessary, you would also have to make it wider and that would require more fill of the marsh. So I uh, wouldn't wanna see that happen. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thanks, Matt. And I only see one more hand up. So we'll go to Pete Slavinsky next and then um, circle back for any final comment from the councils. Uh, hi, everyone. This is uh, Pete Slavinsky. I'm a resident of Scott Road, Three Iron Cloud Road. I'm also a member of the Conservation Commission. And uh, for work, I'm a marine geologist in the state of Maine. And I deal with a lot of, I work with a lot of communities um, talking about adaptation and kind of working through what both communities are doing right now. And I want to, want to just give both communities kudos on undertaking this project um, and being so forward thinking about trying to adapt to sea level rise. And I think we have a wonderful example, wonderful transferable example for other communities in Southern Maine and around Maine on how to be forward thinking and think about how, you know, we can balance um, restoring natural tidal flow and being resilient to climate change by undertaking a project like this and even considering uh, taking a section of road and, and potentially doing away with it. So um, I just I just want to say I think it's it's great that both communities are having this conversation. I think we have a great opportunity um, to really kind of showcase some forward thinking uh, in our communities. So thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. Um, well, I think it sounds I've heard some pretty 
good directive for staff um, for next steps on this. Um, I'm just, I'll, I'll pause here um, and see if any counselors from either council have any additional thoughts um, that they'd like to share at this point or questions that have come up that you think we should be including in the next phase of study. It looks like we're pretty good over here. I'd just like to say, thank uh, staff from both towns for, for bringing this to us. I think it's a uh, practical solution that warrants further investigation and it'll make it a little more difficult for me to get my Christmas tree, but I think I'll survive. Uh, I look forward to hearing more. Great, thanks, John. Um, any any um, final thoughts or last comments from folks on the Cape side? Okay, seeing none, um, I think that's all we have for tonight. So we'll go ahead and um, adjourn the workshop. Um, Matt, I know we have another special meeting coming up after this, and I believe that's on a separate link. I hope it'll be, we'll, we'll keep this link here. Okay, so we'll just hang on every um, here for a minute and um, Scarborough folks, oh, thanks for joining I'll us leave, I'll thanks leave you. you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Okay, and Matt, did you want to, um, we can just pause for a second if you wanted to uh, text Councillor Jordan. Count, okay. Already sent, sir. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Great. Um, any of the attendees who are still with us, uh, we are going into a special council meeting um, with one item on the agenda. If you'd like to stick around and join us for that, you are welcome to do so. Um, we'll get started in just one moment after I pull up the agenda. <laughs> I'll just give Penny one minute to log in and then we'll get started. There we go. That was fast. Welcome, Penny. <laughs> so um, we are convening a special town council meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. It is now 618 on Wednesday, March 16th. And uh, can we begin the meeting um, with a call of the roll, please? Chairman Gabrielson? Here. Councillor Boucher? Here. Councillor Gillis? Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councillor Noonan? Councillor Reiniger? Here. Mr. Chairman, you do have a quorum. Thank you. And uh, we'll go ahead with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, divisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for that. And um, the first item on the agenda, as always, is an opportunity for citizen comment on any items not on the agenda. I would note the only item on the agenda is um, referring the um, housing diverse or, or review of the housing diversity study RFP results and referring review of the proposals to the ordinance committee. Uh, we have currently two attendees. If either of you would like to speak on any item not on the agenda, Please use the raise hand function in Zoom now, and Matt will call on you. All right, seeing none, we have one item, one agenda item here. Um, Matt, could I ask you to, or uh, is Matt or Maureen, which of, you, which of you would like to tee this up? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe our planner, Maureen, is ready to tee this one up uh, at this point. All right, Happy two for two, Maureen, here goes. So I am very happy to report that after a failure to receive any proposals from the RFP issue due January 4th, we now have seven proposals from competent companies to do a housing diversity study. Um, the, the key thing to remember here is that the council was uh, fairly clear on a schedule. You wanted this work done by August 30th. And in order to get that done, 
um, you would ask proposers if they could meet that deadline by April 5th. So the hope is that the ordinance committee, because it now is an expert at evaluating RFPs, could review these RFPs and get an, a, a recommendation to you in time for your April meeting, which if you accept their recommendation puts us just a little more than a week behind the original schedule. Great, thank you for that summary, uh, Maureen. So um, let's go to council discussion. Um, we have a draft motion which is to refer this to the housing diversity study proposals um, to selection to the ordinance committee um, for report back at the April meeting. Um, just for the purposes of starting discussion, do we have a motion? So moved. Great, thanks. Uh, moved by Councilor Caitlin Jordan, seconded by Councilor Penny Jordan. Great, um, any dis uh, discussion on this item? Yeah. Matt. Only uh, item I have on this, Mr. Chairman, is uh, it inadvertently has April 14th identified, and uh, that was an error uh, from the other night. It's actually April 11th. It, that will be Thank the you. Monday. The 14th is a Thursday. So, I, yeah, April 11th is the meeting. Yeah. Right now. Yep. Thank you for that correction. Um, and also, I I'm, I'm apologize. I neglected to ask if there was any public comment on this item. Uh, we have one attendee currently. If you'd like to speak on this item, please use the raise hand function in Zoom to let us know. All right. Um, so any discussion thoughts on this item? Councilor Reiniger. Procedural question. Will, I understand there were seven interested parties. Will the materials of all seven be distributed to all of the members of the council or just to the members of the ordinance committee? They're only they're there. They were included with tonight's agenda. If you'd like to review oh, them. Yeah. Thank you. I just looked at the first page, but not the rest of it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or discussion on this? Councillor Jordan. Yeah, I just want to make sure that um, all of the other councillors are aware that they're more than welcome to attend ordinance committee meetings. So um, I don't want people to think they're being excluded. We just need to expedite uh, this process. So I just want to I just want to throw that out. Um, thanks, Penny. Do you, do, you, do you have a sense of when that, that meeting, the ordinance committee might be? Do you, is there a date on the calendar? The 30th. The 30th, okay. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It's it? next, it's next when, next, the 23rd, the 23rd, 23rd. that's it, yeah. Right. Sorry, Thank I you. moved the 23rd meeting to the 30th, so. So it's on the 23rd and um, we have that scheduled at this point to start at 6.30. Great. Is that at the- at Thank the, you, Penny. What? Is that at, at the- Yeah, um, Council Gillis. Hall? Is it at the town hall? Yes. Okay. It's gonna be in the- it should be in the Jordan conference room, shouldn't it? We're gonna stay it on Zoom. Let's do it in person. It's already scheduled on Zoom, but um, and we'll make sure that everybody knows where it is. Okay. Maureen. Maureen wants to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to say that you had decided to put it on Zoom. You can still decide to hold it in person. The agenda will be going out this week. So I'll, I'll just whatever you wanna do, I'll make it happen. I would really like to have it in person. I think uh, for something like this, it would be great. Sorry. No problem. We, we zoomed because okay. we had this point yet. Yeah, yeah. Councilor and Tim. Not having been through this process before here, uh, will all seven personally show up and be questioned by the ordinance committee? Or will they be interviewed yeah. after the ordinance committee narrows it down to maybe two or three or what would be the... Maureen, why don't you field this one? My plan is to speak with the ordinance committee chair and get that all arranged prior to the meeting. 
So I can't give you an answer now, but I can probably give you the answer on, on the end of this week. Yeah, probably by midday tomorrow. Okay. And so just to clarify, uh, would that then mean scheduling separate times for personal meetings with like the chair of the ordinance committee or maybe any of the counselors all combined or again, I'm just curious how this works. Maureen? Um, so we're, we're kind of working with the flow on this and I keep referring to the WEMA study in that, in that instance, we had two proposers, they were invited to the ordinance committee meeting and then the ordinance committee said, why don't you say a few words? So I'm going to be talking to the ordinance committee chair tomorrow and we will be sorting that out and hopefully having a clear expectation on behalf of the committee and the proposers prior to the meeting on the 23rd. Thank you, Maureen. Um, Council Boucher. I have two comments. So first, um, the seven RFP submittals are in the town cloud IO that we received, but they're not on the town website. So if we could get them out of there for the public to look at, someone was asking me for them today. Um, and then the second point is from a quick memory check, some of these were out of state. So do we, does it need to be a Zoom meeting in order to have them at the table? You are right, Nicole. Back to Zoom, Councilor Jordan. Hey, I, I've got two Zoom meetings going on at the same time. Not right now, I hope. I mean, I do in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's true. Um, in that case, I, unless there's any further discussion that's you know going to change the outcome of what we're voting on, um, I would just ask if people are ready to move on to a vote. Okay, um, could we have a roll call vote, please? Councilor Boucher, yes. Councilor Gillis, yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Yes. Councilor Reiniger. Yes. Chairman Gabrielson. Yes. Motion carries. Great. Thank you to the ordinance committee for agreeing to take this on. Um, and I look forward to seeing your recommendation. Councilor Reiniger. Sorry, one again, the big be the beginner here. Uh, how much of this are, are there confidential aspects of any of this that we shouldn't be probing publicly or is it all like fees or this or that or anything? All it's all sir. public. All right. Just out of respect for the applicants. Councilor Gillis, was that a question? No, that was waving to my kid. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> That's also great. Um, okay, um, with that, uh, we have another opportunity for citizen comment on any items not on the agenda. Mr. Haywood, do you have any comments you'd like to make? We have one person in attendance. Not seeing a Zoom hand go up. I would ask if there is a motion to adjourn. And motion to adjourn. Moved by Councilor Gillis, seconded by Councilor Reiniger. Um, all those, uh, actually, I'm sorry, we need a roll call vote on this. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Gillis? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Reiniger? Yes. Chairman Gabrielson? Yes. Motion carries. And with that, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, and uh, thanks again to the Ordinance Committee for taking this on. And I look forward to seeing you all next week for budget committee meetings. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.